some of the most original forms of architecture in the world. And preserving them is, in a way, preserving world history. Such was the idea behind Shelburne Farms, an historical hub of agriculture's past, located in Shelburne, Vermont. The center is run by a non-profit organization and is dedicated to preserving ag history. I really believe that Americans feel that agriculture is yeah, part of their, part of our roots, part of what we came from, and part of what the founding fathers and mothers felt the country ought to be about. And I think the history of agriculture, especially in Vermont, is very well told through barns. And so the project began in 1972, transforming Shelburne Farms into an agricultural educational experience. Over the years, they've added an education center, the McClure Center for School Programs, the Renaissance School, a children's farmyard, a cheese-making facility, a bakery, a wood shop, and administrative offices. It may look impressive now, but the restoration has been a long process. There were great piles of old pipes and rusty buckets and junk and old batteries and just an incredible amount of, 100 years worth of junk that had been building up dirt floors in a lot of it, and the walls had stuff nailed to them. Raccoon nests everywhere, you just can't imagine. <laughs> and when you combine these renovated buildings with the 1,400 acres of working farm and forest, Shelburne Farms becomes a place that bridges time. But in the end, it's the buildings that make the biggest impression. I think that one of the impressions that people perhaps are left with when, they're, when they experience a building like this is to really look at the importance of design. The size of them, sort of the magnitude of them is very impressive, but yet when you stop and you look sort of beyond that and look at the way the, how the building was so carefully designed for the uses and how today they still, you know, have carried forth over a century um, to be able to um, still be used for, in many ways, the same way they had originally been designed for, and in sometimes for new and adaptive, creative new uses. And in many parts of rural America, barn restoration means a boost to tourism, which means a boost to the local economy. Having the rural landscape with barns still on that landscape really helps contribute to that sense of, of place that people are, are seeking when they come to, uh, to visit an area. And in a time when we seem to be losing connections to the place that we are into our past, agricultural buildings like barns can really provide a connection to our heritage. One thing that I would like to see is for more people to appreciate the history of their barns. I really think that if people understand more about how these barns were used in the past, why they were constructed as they were, that more people have an interest in saving them. Farming is a busy job, and sometimes you're even busier. That's when accidents are more likely to happen, when your 
tired, hungry, or stressed out. Hey, Kelly, how you doing? That's why it's important to pace yourself. Hanging in there, Dad. Stay ready for a break. Short, regular breaks keep you fresh and alert. And when you do stop, pick the right foods. Foods high in carbohydrates energize without making you sleepy. Caffeine-free drinks pick you up without dehydrating your body. Other ways to stay alert? Play the radio. And if you're really brave, sing along. Switch drivers now and then for a change of scenery, or stop once in a while and take a deep breath or two, then exhale slowly. Most importantly, if you're working alone, make sure someone knows where you are and checks on you at regular intervals. There's a lot about farming that you can't control, so take advantage of the things you can control. Take a break and stay alert. Necessity is the mother of invention, which is why 30 years ago, John Deere began publishing technical manuals for service technicians at John Deere dealerships everywhere. The books became immensely popular, and eventually, word of these books spread to the educational community. Soon, schools, libraries, and even customers were requesting the books right and left. John Deere Publishing, this is Lori and John Deere Publishing was born. Today, John Deere Publishing has five comprehensive series of books, such as the Farm Business Management Series, the Machine Operations Series, which deals with farm equipment operation and maintenance, the Service Series on how to service equipment, and the Primer Series on today's hottest agricultural technologies. All the books are designed to easily promote an understanding of technology and the ability to manage agribusiness. Every year we continue to increase the number of titles that we offer. Um, a huge effort is made the last three or four years to actually focus on our farmer customers, some non-John Deere implement dealers, um, in-house training areas, not only for Deere but some of our competitors, along with state-funded training areas, bookstores and distributors. 23 books were published in the first 10 years. Today, they have 44 titles available, with six more in the works. We feel it's very important not only to continually come out with new material, but to update all the material and keep it revised um, all the time. Topics for the books are determined by industry surveys from schools, farmers, and dealers. Writers are selected from the industry's top experts in each particular field. Anyone in the agricultural field can benefit from the information in these books because they offer an easy understanding of technology and an ability to manage effectively in the demanding world of agribusiness because it is always changing. For schools, John Deere Publishing offers a complete teaching curriculum consisting of textbooks, student guides, and an instructor's guide. Slide sets also are available. With what started as an internal information source, John Deere Publishing now gets orders for about 50,000 books a year. I think a lot of our material is very important to individual farmer customers, to the dealers, um, to anyone really who is interested in agriculture. And just being able to interact with them and making sure we're servicing their needs is really important to us because that's what we're all about making sure that we provide the information that they actually need. In the colonial days of America, agriculture was the main economic engine of the new country. That's when a group of merchants and farmers in Philadelphia, including Benjamin Franklin and other signers of the Declaration of Independence, took it upon themselves to promote innovation in farming. They formed the Philadelphia Society for Promoting Agriculture, an organization that's been in continuous operation since 1785. And its contributions to American agriculture are astounding. The Society uh, was instrumental in starting the first agriculture school in the country, which later became Penn State University. Uh, they were instrumental in starting the veterinary school, which is 
still in existence at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, probably one of the leading veterinary schools in the, in the world, I believe. Uh, and we also were very involved in starting of the, what is the uh, Department of Agriculture. Today, the society has taken on a much different role, that of a regulatory organization. And according to past president Leon Wilkinson, it also serves as a way to further ag technology, keeping track of what happens to our food products once they leave the farm. We send it off and hope to be top quality. We want it to be that way so the merchants, researchers, all can help us look into the future for improvement in our operations. And as the oldest operating agricultural society today, it's grown to encompass members from everywhere within the farming industry. We come from all walks of life, from academia, from agriculture, from commercial and corporate side. We feel it's very vital that we promote agriculture as a mainstream part of the economy of this country because without it, we don't eat well and we'll need to produce more and more food. And education plays a key role in making the general public aware that the consumer purchase is only one phase of the farm to market cycle. Children, you know, need to be educated that you, the food just doesn't come from the supermarket. You know, it, it starts at another family's, you know, business. And that's what a family farm is, is, is a business. And the Philadelphia Society for Promoting Agriculture will continue with its message, instilling the love of farming onto future generations. Because with the Society's help looking into the future of agriculture, we can double our food supply in the next 15 to 20 years to meet the demands of feeding the world. produce our food, those who process and distribute it, perform an outstanding service. We have a short film that we will now show dealing with wheat production. Our daily bread, the staff of life, mainstay in the diet of most of the people of the world. It takes men of courage and foresight and skill to produce the millions of bushels of wheat that come from the big wheat country every year. Here's the new Model R diesel tractor, a tractor you'll see more of and hear more about in the wheat country shortly. It's the newest member of the John Deere tractor family, scheduled for production early in 1949. There are several films of an educational nature that point the way to increased income and easier living. And there is an all Hollywood feature picture produced especially for your entertainment. Two of the pictures are in beautiful new Ansco color. Sweat and toil, work days that stretched from sun to sun, pestilence and crop failure, this was the lot of the early settlers who tamed the wilderness and put it to work feeding the world. Today, farming is an easier, more profitable occupation. Improved crop varieties and scientific methods have skyrocketed farm production. When the crop is ready, you want to get it to market or into storage as quickly as possible. And that's when dependable John Deere combines prove their worth. Our next picture in color shows these thrifty combines at work. Watch the greedy way the number 55 eats into this 750 acre field of wheat that's going better than 30 bushels per acre. The 45 bushel auger unloading tank empties in one and a half minutes, whether standing still or on the go. When unloading the number 55 on the go, you don't have to stop the combine to put the auger in operation. This is just one more advantage that means more working time. In the number 12A, the extra large cleaning units with simple, easy adjustments 
ensure saving the most seed and a clean sample in the grain tank. It's not unusual to get decades of service from well-made tractors, but even the most hardy eventually give way to technology and innovation. And when they do, they can begin another life on the antique tractor circuit, such as this show in Hilbert, Wisconsin. This year, the farming community converged on the Keller family farm in a pilgrimage to the way things used to be. You could smell the exhaust all day long. At night when you went in to eat, it was in your clothes. You could smell it. <laughs> This drove and pulled everything around. They said that really worked good. So, not at all. Kind of a mean devil. And a good sturdy sheep. <laughs> if you only weighed 100 pounds. <laughs> Walter Keller, the show's host, has amassed a collection of more than 350 antique tractors. Each one is brought back to a condition that is sure to bring back memories. People enjoy to see the old tractors, and it, not just those that grew up on a farm, but a lot of them that are now living in the city uh, were probably born and raised on the farm where their dad or their grandpa was on the farm. I think people are looking backwards in some respect now for those things that might have been forgotten or almost forgotten and the chance of being lost, and I think they appreciate to see this stuff. The Keller collection includes several Serial 1 tractors, such as the first experimental Type B, and goes back through the 40s, 30s, 20s, and even earlier. The oldest one, of course, would be the Waterloo Boy, which John Deere bought the factory out, and uh, there was Waterloo Boys produced before that, and I think we have it at about 1916, 1917. The old tractors were as rugged as the men and women who rode them, and they didn't have to be moving to be productive. Even in that day, it took little time to knock out new shingles for the roof. You think you have your tractor running smoothly? Would you go so far as to balance it on three Coke bottles to prove it? Sure, that's odd, but not as odd as the only John Deere painted red on the assembly line. This tractor here was built for the uh, city of Waterloo uh, grounds uh, and fire department in 1937. And the reason it was painted red was that the, their color of uh, equipment was red at the time and they wanted it to match the rest of the equipment. So they special ordered it from John Deere this way. And as far as we could tell, it's the only John Deere tractor that was shipped out of the factory painted red. What's Walter Keller's favorite tractor in the bunch? Well, when he had only a few, he might have been able to tell you. He says now there's too many to pick just one. And by the looks of what's hidden behind the barn, it's only going to get worse, or better. I would be living with this the rest of my life. That's collecting disease is incurable. The Belden Daniels family likes to vacation as paying guests at hosts or vacation farms for reasons described by Mr. Daniels. Well, we're city people. We live right in the center of Boston. But we also very much like to get completely away, get out here with the grass and with the farm animals, and very much enjoy being with the farm family. One such working farm can be found near Canova, South Dakota, operated by Alden and Dolores Copeland, who farm 1,400 acres and take in vacationers. And we started about 20 years ago with out-of-state hunters, pheasant hunters, and then uh, we read an article in a farm 
magazine that told about other people taking farm vacationers. And so it interested us, and we uh, sent in our uh, application to the farm vacation guide and listed our farm. And since then, we have kept farm vacationers for the last eight years. <laughs> You know, whenever farmers and ranchers get talking about tractors, well, it's pretty generally agreed that John Deere builds a mighty fine tractor line. Four new power sizes between 35 and 70 horsepower. Four choices, where competition offers you only three. John Deere power steering gives you easy, precise control of your tractor at all times. Positive control, whether you're working in tight feedlot quarters or out in the wide open spaces. In the three larger models of these new tractors, you get a closed center hydraulic system. The same type of hydraulic system you get in larger John Deere tractors, costing thousands of dollars more. The heart of any tractor is its engine. And what a heart these new John Deere tractors have. You get a high torque diesel engine as standard equipment. That's a diesel engine as standard equipment. All John Deere diesel engines feature a rotary fuel pump and direct fuel injection for fast starting in cold or hot weather, plus outstanding fuel economy. Regular equipment also includes a complete lighting system, and we do mean complete. You get two working lights that flood the work area from the rear wheels forward, not just out in front of the tractor. And you get this rear working light that lights up the area behind the tractor. A new transmission. This 4030 is operating in first gear low range. Watch as this second tractor easily passes it in first gear high range. John Deere continues to lead the way in sound control. New developments bring the low 83 decibel rating of today's exceptionally quiet John Deere tractors down even lower to consistently record levels of 79, 80, and 81 decibel. John Deere continues to lead the way in sound control. Farm toys are for kids, right? Not necessarily. Not when farm toy shows across the world, like this one in Dyersville, Iowa, transform gymnasiums into farm toy meccas that awaken the sleeping child in all of us. Set in the heart of the Midwest, where farm equipment manufacturing is a way of life, Dyersville is the home of the Ertl Toy Company, maker of most die-cast farm toys you'll find today. Whether you push it, pedal it or drive it with remote control, there's somebody who collects it. And farm toy shows like this one display some of the greatest accumulations of farm toy collectibles in the world. Vendors from across the United States, as well as England, the Netherlands and Germany, fill buildings and halls to capacity. These farm toy shows attract a wide range of people from all walks of life. It attracts farmers, it attracts business people, lawyers. It really is interesting for uh, the different motivations that people have to collect and uh, it's fun. They, and they all have a story to tell. If you talk to some of the folks around here, they've all got their reasons and, and uh, they truly enjoy what they're doing in collecting the farm toys. But wherever they come from, or whatever they do, the people here have one common bond. Their love of farm toys. I've got my own collection. I collect all brands trucks, race cars, just about anything, you know. The house is full, so we added on, and now it's full again, so I don't know what we'll do now. Farm toy collecting has even caught up to the World Wide Web, as buyers and sellers hit the net to find pieces for their collection. More and more people are online, and farmers are online, checking all kinds of things, um, grain prices, weather, and they want to know about their farm toys, too. So we're there. 
this is an opportunity for the collector to see our product before it comes out, see what's coming to the stores. They can post classified ads, they can advertise their show on it. It's really the future for farm toys. For some, the love of farm toys goes beyond just buying. Gilson Rieke of Spencer, Iowa is proud of this tractor because he built it himself. Okay, I'll turn it on here. It's got an electric motor in there. And and the flywheel runs and the belt pulley runs and then it's got electric lights on it. It usually takes me from six to eight months to make a pattern. And then from then on, and you can put one together a day if you want them. Prices at farm toy shows can range from spare change cheap to, well, a little more expensive. But whether you're here to find something for a few dollars or a few hundred, there's one thing for certain. Collecting farm toys brings out the kid in all of us. It spans generations, bringing together fathers, daughters, and grandparents sharing a common interest. And for a few days, carpet farming has its own little field of dreams at this little piece of heaven, like this one, right here in Iowa. In the big town of Beaumont, Texas, tractors and tractor safety are important issues. If you want to know just how important, ask four-year-old Trey Thompson. He may very well be the youngest safety spokesman farmers have ever had. Trey first started getting interested in this, I think, at a John Deere day uh, when he was two years old. And this is a rollover bar, and you stay away from the PTO and, uh, uh, Dad. Wise way beyond his four years, Trey is reaching people young and old with his safety message. I, I like talking to people about safety because I, um, because I want them to be, be, be safe. He is uh, very conscious about what I'm doing, and he makes sure that if I'm around a tractor, I'm safe, and he is safe. This is a slow vehicle site. And it's really funny getting instructions from a four-year-old. It's for when you're going slow on the road. It's about, Dad, make sure you have your seatbelt on. It lets people see you when you're driving. So he's, he's always making sure that we, we do it the right way. This is a seatbelt that keeps you from falling off. you got to have a seatbelt on. Trey's position as young safety spokesman may be merely ceremonial now, but his dad thinks there could be a career in there somewhere. He may make a, a great tractor salesman one day. He's, he loves tractors. Uh, where kids his age are playing with blocks, he's with tractors. And that's, that's what his thing is, is tractors. Y'all be safe now. Bye! Some call him a weather prophet. Some call him a weather guru. Well, either way, Albert Fichot is a guy who has a pretty good idea of what will or will not fall from the sky next week. A lifelong resident of North Bay, Ontario, Fichot is a farmer who spent nearly 65 years observing the weather. Thanks to years of practice, Fichot can read nature like a meteorologist reads a radar screen. Some people, well, uh, let's say they'll go outside and they won't see it because they're not looking for that. But like me, uh, everything means something to me. For instance, like uh, this year, I start the 19th of August. So it's marked here on my own writing, small frost and small fog. So that's mean 90 days from this date, it's going to be the frost, it's going to be mild weather, and then the fog means it's going to rain, light rain. It's going to be mild. 
in, in November. By carefully noting the weather every day, Fischo interprets the notes to forecast about three months ahead. Then he rechecks his forecast by keeping an eye on the nature around him. The sparrow, when they're flying low, it's going to have a storm in the summer. And then the, 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 the Canada geese, when they're moving south from north to south, if they fly real on top of the sky, that means there's a storm below them. But if they're flying at a nice level there, that means there's no storm. Eh? And the skies aren't the only place he looks. Many times the animals on his farm help him in his forecasting. The cows will stay near the stable if there, there's a storm. Or uh, let's say uh, that there's going to be some bad weather, the cow, they lick, they lick their hair the other way. Like uh, if the hair goes that way, they lick that way because they are itchy. Or my horse is uh, yawning, you know, in the outside on the stable, that's rain. Or my dog, if he roll on the ground, eh? Then he'll roll the other way, and he'll roll the other way, and all of a sudden, he's pointing that way, and he's rolling back and forth. The wind, the next day, will come that way. What Mother Nature tells Fischo has made him a bit of a local celebrity. He's been featured on television, radio, and in various newspapers. And you've got to admit, his talent comes in handy during haying time. Then, in the summer, let's say the cigada in the bush, it whistles, eh? Every day, every day, you can count for three weeks of hot, hot, hot weather. And then if it's in, uh, if it's in July, start your hay and don't worry about the rain. Or let's say the leaves, like you know the leaves, uh, they're upside down. That's mean in a couple of days, two, three days, there's rain in the forecast. Fischot doesn't want to divulge all his weather forecasting secrets, but he's the first to admit he doesn't know everything there is to know about the weather. He just tries to predict it rather than understand it. I always say Mother Nature is my boss. <laughs> Mother Nature is always right. It's up to us to pick it up, eh? It's tough to be heard in Washington, D.C., especially from a farm in Nebraska or a ranch in Wyoming. But it's tougher not to be heard because what's done there will affect you here at home. All adv advocacy groups uh, or pressure groups or interest groups or lobbying groups or uh, just organization groups, they all, they're all the same, uh, advocate for, lobby for uh, members of their group lobby here in Washington as well as in state legislatures and locally for the farmers and the ranchers that belong to the organization and really for all of agriculture uh, for that matter. The role of lobbyists is often misunderstood but in fact they're an essential part of the democratic process representing their constituencies as the wheels of power turn. The lobbyist educates, informs, defends making sure the concerns of their constituents are aired and duly considered on matters that affect them. When Congress is in, when the government is engaged in governing the country, we are engaged in that process. And that's what we try to endeavor to do every day, is stay engaged at the process level. As I tell my staff, I want them to be at the uh, epicenter of every debate that affects cattle producers in Washington. And we try to make sure that we're at that epicenter every day on all the issues that we cover here. Many of the most effective lobbying groups are grassroots organizations, deriving the policies they espouse from members and member organizations. This entails an extensive two-way communication process, keeping members abreast of what's happening and listening to their concerns. On a hot issue, we hear from the country, telephone calls, more and more emails and faxes now from farmers. Uh, cell phones, you know, from the tractor or combine occasionally or from the pickup, uh, but, but still uh, letters on the hot issues. 
And we make an effort also to generate letters to Congress on issues like a year ago, the death tax reform, federal estate tax reform. We really, we really need to hear from the country. We have an entire communication services department that puts out a weekly newsletter uh, to uh, 15 or so thousand members. Um, we have an active dynamic website that is updated daily uh, with information on uh, both policy uh, and technical information. We also have a field staff network that visits on a daily basis farms and gins out in the country to make sure that we hear from farmers, but we also communicate back to farmers and ginners what the Cotton Council is doing on their behalf. We have two policy meetings a year. At those policy meetings, the delegates from the state cattle associations push push policy through the process, and at the end they vote on it, um, what they want us to do. Still, with all the effectiveness and clout the various lobbying groups can claim, the individual farmer remains his own best lobbyist. Nothing is quite so effective with congressmen as the direct action of a voter. We gotta tell them how it affects us on our farm. That's the most effective lobbying, say, Senator so-and-so, here is how this is affecting me on my farm. That is, a, uh, uh, that is the best lobbying that can be done because they want to do what's right. Ralph and I always enjoyed breakfast. It was kind of our special time together. We'd talk about the kids, now grown, our grandchildren, our plans for the day, you know, just everyday stuff. On that particular morning, he was in a hurry to get his chores done before meeting a couple of friends to discuss, well, it was either a fishing or hunting trip, I can't recall which. Anyway. I just left the house and was on my way to town when I saw it happen. In a hurry or not, no one should ever, ever use a forklift or bucket to move bales. When handling any size bale, they should be retained by using the proper attachment either a bale grapple or bale spear. Always make sure that the attachment is properly secured. When using the bale spear, always put the spear into the middle of the bale for the most control. Make sure your tractor and loader are properly matched to handle your particular size bale. Set proper tractor tread width and use the right balance of weight for added tractor stability. Always wear your seatbelt and transport low and slow to prevent tractor rollover. And don't forget to read and understand your operator's manual. Because not everyone gets a second chance. Qualified repair and maintenance technicians are crucial to the success of John Deere dealerships everywhere. And to keep that steady stream of talent coming, John Deere partners with several colleges, such as Arkansas State University at Beebe. It's a win-win relationship that helps schools fulfill their mission to the community and meet dealers' needs for what they call high-performance career partners. With the changing in technology that they have today and the advanced technology that John Deere has, uh, they are looking for trained technicians. Today's equipment uh, that John Deere has is, is certainly different than it was some years ago. We're going to move on into the engines. The program, which leads to an associate degree, requires two summer internships with a dealer sponsor, as well as two years of more traditional coursework. 
Jason Gibbs, a native of Beebe, is among this year's crop of students balancing practical experience and the books. My classes are usually focused on basically hydraulics, learning fundamentals of hydraulics, electronics, electronic technologies. You have to do your regular college curriculum, which considers your math classes, your algebra class, and your uh, physical science class. The Rural Equipment Company in Damascus, Arkansas, is Jason's dealer sponsor. Jason pays tuition to Arkansas State, but his sponsor pays for books and incidentals. I was a little skeptical of some of the things that, you know, I kind of thought would come out of there in the beginning, and you never know until you tried. But since having Jason here during the summer and seeing uh, his abilities and uh, his knowledge and stuff, I, I'm enthused with it. I, I, I wouldn't mind having four or five, you know, young men sponsored in the program. They kind of treat me special different since I'm kind of like enrolled in a college program. They uh, usually call me schoolboy or somebody like that or something. We don't call him Jason anymore, we call him Pigpen. You know, the next thing you know, you look up and there's Jason uh, Pigpen just breaking into these tractors, breaking them in half, and then just, he literally just crawls right into his work. They're always poking fun at me, but we all get along really well, and it's just a good program to be in. Like many kids from agricultural families, it doesn't matter what else you're doing, there's work waiting for you on the farm. Even so, it was Jason's parents who set him on the John Deere career path. My husband saw an article in the local newspaper and he thought it would be a perfect opportunity for, Jay for Jason because he is mechanically inclined. He works on the tractors. Basically, he just put on a front end loader last week, uh, repairs or something. He, uh, ever since uh, he's been going to school up there, he's just been handy as a pocket on a shirt, you know. Jason's short-term future is pretty well mapped out for him at school. And if he isn't thinking long-term right now, somebody in the household is. He'll probably end up being president of John Deere Company, I imagine, before it's all over with. The technical program appealed to Jason. But other college-level John Deere career partnerships include ag marketing, parts specialist, and ag management. For more information, see your local John Deere dealer. To a few farmers today, soybeans are not just your average crop. Their specialty bean varieties are about to pay off in a big way. The markets are increasingly there to reward you if you give the market something that it really wants. The highest premiums are the varieties that taste good and have good process yield for making either soy milk or tofu. There are probably no more than 15 to 20 of those varieties available in the United States. There's a steady flow of new varieties coming out of several research centers that uh, are minimizing the yield drag for those beans. High sucrose soybeans from DuPont Optimum Quality Grains, for example, hold promise for income boosting premiums. The real value of these new beans isn't in their higher sugar content, but in their lack of stachios, a mere fraction of the amount found in typical soybeans. In monogastric animals, such as hogs, cats, and dogs, stachyose causes intestinal gas. Low stachyose beans have great commercial possibilities. In dry pet food, soy-based milk replacers for pigs, and in soy milk for people. The primary demand for these food-grade beans is coming from the Japanese market, followed by a couple other Asian markets, followed by an increasingly dynamic domestic market here in the United States for food-grade beans. While the specialty bean boom is still in its infancy, big soybean breeders like DuPont, Pioneer, and Monsanto are gearing up for greater possibilities. Acreage is growing. Better varieties are already here, and more breakthroughs are about to move from the agronomy plots to farms. I deal in totally with soybeans and breeding and genetic studies, and primarily now in the job I'm working on is breeding soybeans for human consumption. We've just released a small seeded type 
that is uh, aimed at the, uh, for natto production in Japan. Natto is a specialty food type that they uh, produce in Japan. They need small yellow round soybeans about half the size of ordinary green types. Another area we're working in is large seeded type for use as a whole vegetable soybean and this has a potential for use in this country as a fresh green vegetable or allowed to ripen and then used like ordinary dried beans are used. Other specialty beans include a tofu bean lacking an enzyme that gives other tofu beans an off flavor, a soybean with better oil quality, and a soybean whose oil has less saturated fat. Low-sat beans developed at Iowa State University and licensed to Pioneer have 8% saturated fat versus 15% in normal beans. That makes them more competitive with canola, which touts one gram of saturated fat per tablespoon. And these specialty beans are just the beginning. The whole range of soybean markets is looking at new genetic material, whether it's the feed grade, the industrial, or the food grade. And we have some exciting things that will be available within just a couple years. To benefit wildlife, cattle farmers and ranchers are doing more than ever before to protect the environment. Take Gray Markser. For the past 24 years, he and his wife Sue have managed the Matador Cattle Company in Dillon, Montana for Coke Industries. The ranch encompasses a quarter of a million acres, where the Marksers maintain a cattle herd of approximately 6,500 cow-calf pairs and stock 800 cattle. In cooperation with government, university, and environmental organizations, the Marxers implemented a rest rotation grazing system. In place now for 23 years, the plan calls for a three-pasture rest rotation, where one-third of the range is rested each year and seasonal use of the land is alternated. The first third of it will be grazed early in the growing season. The second third will be grazed following seed ripe time where the cattle can uh, uh, knock the seeds out of the grass plants, they'll fall to the ground and then their hoof trampling will, will implant those seeds. They also are incorporating some of that dead plant matter into the soil. The other third, the, the final third, is rested completely that year. The environmental impact is remarkable. The area now has increased vegetation and supplies winter range for a healthy number of elk, mule deer, and moose. Less erosion has created crystal clear streams to make it a popular fishing and hunting location. For their efforts, Ray and Sue were recognized as regional winners of the 8th Annual Environmental Stewardship Award Program, presented by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I guess the, the biggest honor that we feel towards that is that uh, we've shown a lot of the public uh, positive things about our industry, what's going on, and the, uh, the good interactions and relationships that we've formed through the years with different agencies, different groups, different individuals, to have a positive effect on our environment. And the Marxers are keeping the message going. The Matador Cattle Company is a key sponsor and host for Conservation Day an event that teaches the area's seventh graders on the ground lessons in conservation. One of the things, of course, for Sue and I and some of us is that uh, we're setting an example for our children and for future generations to, to take care of the land. I mean, God quit making land and uh, he's given us this and it's our job to take care of it. That's a big responsibility, we, we don't take it lightly. So what motivates a family to take on such a huge responsibility for the environment? Probably the same answer you'd hear from most any farmer you'd ask. 
mostly it has to come from here. It's, it's got to be a love for the land, uh, a genuine sense that whether you own that land or not, you're responsible for its care and for its long-term sustainability, both from an economical standpoint, running a business on it, and also from an environmental standpoint that it's, it's got to be taken care of. The goal was to allow American producers to farm for the market, not for the government program. Of course, in exchange for that, many of the farm subsidy programs will be phased out over a period of time, and that's what's being done. Freedom isn't free. In exchange for getting the federal government out of farming, American farmers forego the protection of government supports and subsidies. They'll all be phased out by 2002. A brave new world is coming, bright with promise, fraught with challenge. Markets will fluctuate. Some years will have better markets than others. And farming will always be that way. It even was that way under the heavy government programs. They need to provide for their own risk management. When the safety nets are gone, managing risk will become the preeminent challenge of farming. Success and even survival will depend on it. Ready or not, come 2002, the task of shoring up against the uncontrollables, of preparing for the unforeseen, will fall squarely on the shoulders of individual farmers. Preparation is the key, beginning with knowing your options and imperatives. First and foremost, it is imperative to develop a complete and thorough understanding of your operation tracking its financial health, and analyzing the profitability of various crops, for example. Because only by knowing where you are today can you chart an effective course into the future. Next, begin to explore with an eye to mastering volatility tools like futures and options and crop insurance. These can become your safety nets of the future. I think what farmers are facing is needing to turn to more private sector uh, ways to plan the uh, agricultural markets. They'll need to participate more in uh, futures programs and things like that to try to level out the bumps uh, in the marketplace as a lot of other uh, businesses uh, have done in the past. Producing specialty seeds under contract is one way to smooth risk though it will require a relinquishing of some of a farmer's newfound freedom. Management assistance, too, is now readily available from grain companies and other upmarket players. It comes at a price, but may be the best means of navigating the transition to freedom, a means of leveling the learning curve. However, even with this option, it's critical the farmer remains an active participant in managing his operation. Regardless of how free farmers will be to farm, however, government will continue to play a significant role in American agriculture, now and beyond 2002. It's imperative to make your voice heard. There are many things that are happening, both at the state level and at the federal level, that impact agriculture greatly. And if producers don't get active, just like any other citizen, they may have to bear the burden some rules and regulation or some legislation that is not to their benefit. As we look ahead, we certainly need more opportunities. We need more opportunities to market. We need more opportunities to look at new crops and look at new markets, entrepreneurship on the farm, uh, and government not to get into the way.
You'll pick quicker when safety problems don't slow you down. Fire hazards, for example. Three simple steps help keep you harvesting nonstop. First, prevent fires from starting. Clean out the places where debris collects because engine heat or friction can ignite the cotton. After each dump, clean the heads of trash, grease, and spindle twists. And remember safety precautions when you clean out. Second, keep two fire extinguishers charged and ready. 10-pound ABC extinguishers. One in the picker cab, another near the engine. Check the extinguishers every day. Make sure the gauges read full charge and don't lose pressure by testing them. In fact, once you use any extinguisher, even for the smallest fire, refill it or replace it. A new extinguisher costs a lot less than a new picker. Third, plan ahead. Know what to do in an emergency. Be ready to act fast. Turn off the fan system. If you have time, move to an already harvested area. Keep away from unharvested cotton, dead grass, modules, or other equipment. If you think there's a fire in the basket, turn the dump side downwind. Dump and move the picker away. Keep thinking safety first. Always stop the engine and set the parking brake before you climb down. Extinguish any fire in the picker heads. Next, check the engine and main chassis. Tell others in the area if they can help or if they should stay clear. And if you suspect there is a fire, never enter a picker basket, module builder, trailer, or bowl buggy basket. You could send air to the smoldering cotton and cause a flash fire right where you're walking. Remember, plan ahead for fire hazards. Clean out frequently. Keep extinguishers ready. And pre-think your emergency plans. Because you'll pick quicker when you harvest safely. You'll pick quicker when you think safety first. For more cotton picker safety information, stop by after the show. I am a farmer. My name is Greg Clausen. I come from uh, Whitewater, Kansas, which is located in south central part of the great city of Kansas. I grew up on a farm and I farm with my father and uh, two, two brothers back in Kansas. We have a grain and livestock operation. But a number of years ago, I got involved in a little hobby of ventriloquism. And so this, uh, this evening, I have been asked to pack up my friends, bring them along, and introduce them to you folks. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is Dudley, yeah, and he is my uh, snipe, that's right, he's a snipe, yeah. And, uh, oh, John Deere, John Deere, yes, uh-huh, Sloan Implement, yes, that lady's late, yes, she's fine. You're late, ma'am, she knows, yes, okay, all right. Oh, I like her. I like her too, yeah. Anyway, what we're going to do, you know, folks don't get to see a snipe very often. No, they don't. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to find out a little bit about the habitat of the snipe. Yeah, you know, the kinds, a lot of women. Yeah, there are a lot of women here, but let's just do the show. Okay, all right. Ode to a pig farmer. All right. A man stood before the pearly gates. His face was old and beat. He stood before the angels there to walk the golden street. What have you done, St. Peter asked, to gain admission here? I've been a pig farmer, sir, for many, many years. But pearly gates swung open wide. St. Peter rang the bell. Come on in, son, sit a while. You've done your time in hell. Thank you that much. <laughs> well, I think we need to wrap it up on a positive note. Right, maybe you've got a little word of wisdom you could leave with these folks. Yeah. Never criticize a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. Never criticize a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do criticize him, you'll be a mile away. <laughs> and you'll be wearing his shoes. <laughs> All right, now, Harley, huh? we're going to stick you back in a trunk. That's the part I hate. I know you hate this part, but we got to do it. It stinks in there. I know it does. What are you doing? I'm putting you down. It's a tight fit. I know it is. I liked it out there. Would you be quiet? What are you doing? I'm going to stick your legs down beside your ears, and then I'm going to shut the lid. You're going to do what? I'm going to stick your legs down beside your ears, and then I'm going to shut the lid. Looks like you're going to change my diapers. <laughs> Just get yourself ready. You ready? 
All right, here we go. I'm gonna count to three, and, and when I get to three, I'm gonna stick them down, and push them down, shut the lid. All right, all right, here we go. One, mm -hmm. two, it stinks. I know it does. I got snipe hair all over me. No, you don't, just nip it. All right, okay, here we go. Touchy, touchy, touchy. Three, <laughs> down your feet go beside your ears. Boy, what? No wonder it stinks in here. Shut the lid. <laughs> Thank you much. You've been a good group. In the expanding world of precision farming, keeping up with the latest equipment and technology is vital. Maybe even more important, however, is learning how to interpret the information this new technology provides. Being able to read your results and learn from them is key to utilizing precision farming for better farm management. And toward that end, leading agricultural companies have developed a program, more information, more control. It's a precision farming class designed to help farmers become better decision makers and long-term planners. Probably the biggest thing I'm going to take home is sitting down and writing down what I want to do, uh, what, how I'm going to approach those goals, not only in the short term but the long term. I don't do enough of that type of thing. Like a lot of people, I'm involved in the day-to-day -day activities and you get kind of tied up in those and you forget about the long-range planning. The class is hosted throughout the heart of precision farming country by equipment and implement dealers including John Deere, Farmland, Growmark, Countrymark, and Senex Land Lakes. In a cooperative effort, these companies have joined forces to design a class that focuses on nine objectives, all geared at providing farmers the skills they need for effective management, such as interpreting yield maps, deciding what records to keep, utilizing the power of GIS, planning and goal setting, measuring the benefits from precision farming, calculating a simple cost-benefit analysis, doing reliable on-farm testing, working with area farmers to collect data, understanding, implementing and profiting from precision agriculture. Probably the most important part for me was the was how to overlay the maps and uh, maybe for me to open myself up to uh, have a better visual uh, analysis of the maps that I have at home. Uh, I, per I think looking back I may have not been interpreting my own maps the way I thought they should have been. Uh, I'm going to go home and after this class and take another look at them certainly. More information, more control is aimed at growers interested and involved in precision farming as well as crop consultants and others in agribusiness. We've really had people of all skill levels involved in this process. In general, the ones who go home with the greatest appreciation, the greatest value, are probably those who would say that they have one or two years of experience. In essence, they've gathered some information or they're at the point of wanting to gather some precision information. And consequently, they're either wanting to know where do I go with it or how do I efficiently gather it. Another benefit of more information, more control, is its non-sales, stress-free approach. It's very uh, non-committal. There's nobody trying to sell anything here. And I think that's a very good issue to go into because it's, it's very wide open and any type of question you ask is going to be answered from a non-sales point. And that's why I think it's very important that you do this type of session. To find out more about more information, more control, or to register for an upcoming class in your area, see your local John Deere dealer or call toll-free at 1-888-258-0208. You'll harvest quicker when safety problems don't slow you down. Fire hazards, for example. Three simple steps help you keep harvesting non-stop. First, prevent fires from starting. Clean out the places where debris collects because friction or engine heat can ignite the cotton. Also, look for signs of excessive heat or play in the bearings. Second, 
keep two fire extinguishers charged and ready. 10 pound ABC extinguishers. One in the cab, another near the engine. Check the extinguishers every day. Make sure the gauges read full charge and don't lose pressure by testing them. In fact, once you use any extinguisher, even for the smallest fire, refill it or replace it. A new extinguisher costs a lot less than a new stripper. Third, plan ahead. Know what to do in an emergency. Be ready to act fast. Turn off the fan system. Turn off and raise the row units. Then turn off the cleaner. If you have time, move to an already harvested area. Keep away from unharvested cotton, dead grass, modules, or other equipment. If you think there's a fire in the basket, turn the dump side downwind, dump, and move the stripper away. Keep thinking safety first. Always stop the engine and set the parking brake before you climb down. Extinguish any fire in the row units. Next, check the engine and main chassis. Tell others in the area if they can help or if they should stay clear. And if you suspect there is a fire, never enter a stripper basket, module builder, trailer, or bowl buggy basket. You could send air to the smoldering cotton and cause a flash fire right where you're walking. Remember, plan ahead for fire hazards. Clean out frequently. Keep extinguishers ready and pre-think your emergency plans because you'll harvest quicker when you harvest safely. You'll pick quicker when you think safety first. For more cotton stripper safety information, stop by after the show. Early on, Monty Roberts learned the value of being a good listener. He realized animals, like people, will tell you exactly what they want if you just take the time to listen to them. By observing wild mustangs, Monty was able to discover equus, the unspoken language of the horse. But more importantly, Monty discovered a way of communicating that did not use force, did not use violence, and is just as effective with people as with horses. My childhood influenced my philosophy about horses in a most profound way. My father was the quintessential tough, traditional horseman. You hurt them before they hurt you, kid. That type of thing. And that, what, along with watching him bash these horses into submission, did everything to form my opinion about how we have no right to deal with horses or any other animal in a violent way. My upbringing was everything I am to change me, to realize that violence isn't the answer. What the answer is then is communication and understanding, building trust and a partnership through the animal's language. Monty calls this process of earning the horse's trust, join up. Join up actually is that moment when the horse decides, I want to be with you. I don't want to be away from you. That's the moment of join up. But the procedure join up to cause the horse to accept its first saddle, bridle, and rider is a procedure where the horse, being a flight animal, wants to leave you, go away, and that you let them go away. Anything they want to do is okay, but you encourage them to go away. And after you've pushed them away a sufficient length of time, they gesture back that they want to change, renegotiate the deal. And then you gesture to them that you will accept them in. The key is to give positive reinforcement. The key is not to wait for them to do something wrong and punish them for it. The key is to wait for them to do something right and reward them for it. That's what join up is and that's how it works. It's a process that deals in their language to gain trust and to let them know that while they know you're a predator, you're not there to cause them any harm. Judge me by what I do, not by what I am. These same concepts will work 
just as well for people on the assembly line, as they do for children, as they will for prisoners, as they will for educational systems, in the family, at home. The whole gamut of human relationships is affected by the very concepts that the horses are trying to teach us. Horses are great teachers, and if we'll just listen to them, they will show us that violence is never the answer, that negotiation is the answer, that communication is the answer, but violence cannot be the answer. Violence is for the violator, not for the victim. Hi, I'm NASCAR driver Chad Little. I make my living racing this car. I think I'm a pretty lucky guy because I get paid to do what I love. As a professional, I don't take safety for granted, and neither should you. Take the steel roll cage, for example. The roll cage forms a protective area around the driver. And these seat belts keep me safe in the car. The seat belts and the roll cage should always be used together. It's the same with your tractor. Rollover protection, or ROPS, is built into the cab of your tractor. And combined with your seat belt, it'll keep you in the safety zone in the event of a rollover. The same is true with open station tractors. Use the rollover protective structure and buckle up the seat belt to keep yourself within the safety cage. It makes a life or death difference. Think it can't happen to you? It's that fast. Here's what happens in a rollover when you don't use the ROPS and seat belt. Using a ROPS and seat belt means the difference between walking away from a rollover or being carried away. Operate like a professional. Injuries aren't cool. Winning is. Besides, I have a lot more riding on this race than the checkered flag. We'll see you out there. John Deere is world famous for the manufacture of just about any machine that has to do with working the surface of the earth. How about a thousand feet below the surface? In the Northwest Territories of Canada, at a gold mine operated by Royal Oak Mines, the Gator has found a place amongst the heavy machines of hard rock mining. Not many people would need a Gator for this kind of work, but the mine's heavy equipment mechanic, Craig Jans, says they fit into the day-to-day -day operations of the mine perfectly. We started using them in January this year. We started out with one, and now we have two, and there's another one on the route, so I think the total fleet's gonna end up somewhere around eight. Geologists use them, the, the uh, surveyors, the mechanics use it to go out to serve as equipment, uh, and, and the shifters use it to go out and check their people at the face. Tough, maneuverable, and economical, the Gator is a utility vehicle that will take the rough treatment of a gold mine and keep coming back for more. There's many adverse conditions down the mine. There's a lot of slippery conditions, water, uh, a lot of muck laying around that you have to drive over, stuff like that. They are uh, small enough that they can fit in our cage, that we can take them down the cage. And that we can go from level to level by using the, uh, the uh, hoisting system here. They can get into the tight spots. Uh, a lot of the mining is done in very enclosed area, and the gators are good to get to and from the work site. These gators aren't your off-the-shelf models. Royal Oak Mines adds many safety features to make the gators mine safe. Well, our gators are equipped with the uh, rollover protection bars. We put on the uh, catalytic scrubbers, uh, special lights, so no flashing lights, so they can, because they've been low profile, that the people can see them and the operators can see these units sitting in the drift. They got great visibility. You can, uh, you can see anywhere with them. Uh, you, you're not restricted by a cab or whatever. What we like best about the Gators are that they're, they're economical to operate, that they're, they're a light uh, unit, uh, they're very cheap to repair, 
and uh, so far we found them quite uh, durable. Personally, I like them great. I, I like them for undergo. I find them very maneuverable, easy to just ride. So far, you've been excellent, yes. I found them doing a well job for us. Narrow row corn has been a hot topic for the past few years. So hot that today many seed companies, universities, and farmers are planting narrow row test plots of their own. Early results indicate that the biggest benefit to narrow rows is faster early season light interception. If we have sunlight that comes down and, and misses this leaf, it's basically lost and gone forever. Uh, the sunlight that hits the soil uh, is just like leaving your window open in your house in the middle of the winter time. That heat energy is, is lost forever. So what we're doing with narrow rows is trying to, to get that light intercepted fast early in the season so we can produce more dry matter with it. Early season light also helps shade out some of the later weeds that emerge. So if you have weed problems that come up late in the season, like black nightshade, you actually get better weed control when you go to narrow row crops. Research also suggests you should rethink seeding rates when moving to narrow rows. If you're not planting 25,000 plus per acre, uh, you probably ought to be looking at trying to get your seeding rate up before you think about narrowing the rows. Uh, many of the producers that are getting the largest benefit from narrow rows are actually ending up with harvest populations above 30,000 plants per acre. It seems hours of sunlight have the most significant effect on narrow row yields. The more daylight hours during the growing season, the more sunlight will be on your crop. That's why narrow row corn crops in the northern corn belt, where the sun is out for 15 to 16 and a half hours a day in June, tend to yield better than narrow rows in the southern corn belt, where there are less than 15 hours of daylight in June. And the right machinery is crucial to your success in narrow row corn. The equipment implications are probably the primary reason to go very slow at this because he has to uh, modify existing equipment or buy rather expensive new equipment. It is very difficult to cultivate narrow row corn because you have very little leeway uh, for the tractor tires between the rows because many farm tractor tires are 14, 16 inches wide and if we're talking about 16 to 20, maybe even 22 inch rows, there's very little leeway there. It's a whole new equipment line that needs to be uh, purchased or uh, found to rented, borrowed, that type of thing. John Deere already offers planters for 15-inch rows. So while it would be easy to offer a complete 15-inch corn system, John Deere stuck with more sensible and more economic 20-inch row equipment. We haven't seen much yield advantage to going to rows less than, than 20 inches, so the economics aren't there for most producers. And the second reason is when we go to a header narrower than, than 20 inches, we aren't able to put those drag chains in and snapping rollers on both sides of the row. And this uh, makes it more difficult for us to give us an all crop uh, condition type header. And we pride ourselves in our headers working well even in, in, in down corn. Every farm is different and every region is different. That's why anyone considering switching to narrow row corn needs to look at their situation and make their decision for themselves. Narrow rows or wide rows aren't for everyone, so our objective as a company is to have the equipment that they need for the different cropping practices that are most profitable on their farm. There's a new rising star in the restaurant world, appealing to the most discriminating diners at the world's best restaurants, to the family on the go at fast food joints everywhere. This new culinary delight isn't that new at all. It's pork. Well, right now, I think a lot of people are choosing pork. For one, it's lower in fat. Uh, it is so versatile that you can do so many things with it. And the public seems to just be really on fire with it, right? And, you know, the last couple years, it's just really come of age. Pork is doing very well in our menu and in a lot of other menus. Uh, most restaurants you can go to nowadays, you'll find some type of ribs. So uh, I think pork is doing very well. 
According to Restaurants and Institutions, a food service industry magazine, pork tenderloin was the number one meat item added to menus in the past year. In fact, pork tenderloin was the cut of choice for more than half the participating chefs at the National Taste of Elegance competition. Pork's good to work with for several reasons. One that comes to mind is the fact that you can get so many different cuts and availability of different ways to prepare it. Uh, you can get everything from a chop to a loin to a tenderloin. You can get it uh, medallion style. You can get it already, you know, the whole rack and, you know, braise that and serve that whole as a family style type of meal. Uh, it's a very easy product to work with and uh, it's very highly accepted around this, the Midwest. The pork industry's checkoff funded celebrated chefs program is likely responsible for some of pork's increased interest at some of the nation's leading restaurants. And thanks to other checkoff funded promotional efforts, pork entrees are being served up at a growing number of national restaurants as well. Dairy Queen is the first major fast food chain to put a pork item on its menu year round. And TGI Fridays has introduced four new entrees in a new menu segment called the Chop House. These are being promoted through national TV ads and appear on the TGIF menu at 480 locations. And of course, pork continues to dominate the breakfast scene. Every year, Denny's has its Slam Breakfast promotion at its 1,650 restaurants nationwide. The breakfast entree includes bacon, ham, sausage, and Canadian bacon. Pork sells itself. Uh, on a daily basis, we try to run uh, a pork special a lot of times for lunch because they eat it up. But we do things like a pomeray pan gravy on a weekly basis that people come in and ask for every week. We sell just as much pork as we do beef. Um, it, it's, it's a close race, and as long as that trend continues, pork will do, do well in this industry. And with so much success in such a short period of time, it looks like the demand for pork at restaurants will continue to be hog wild. Out west, under the great skies of Nebraska and Wyoming, a pioneer spirit dwells within the people who are creating an entirely new agricultural industry based on this lowly weed. And they're doing it one pot at a time. The common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca, is one of 500 varieties that is native to North America and of 1900 worldwide. Although once referred to as the greatest underachiever among plants, this multifaceted species could be the crop of the next century. Native Americans long utilized the qualities of the plant as a medicine, food, and as an insulator within their robes. During World War II, hand harvesting milkweed pods became vital to national security, replacing kapok as the buoyant filling in life jackets for the Allied war effort. With pods worth 20 cents a pound, it also helped the rural economy make ends meet in a time of shortages. In the 1970s, with the energy crisis, the milkweed was again scrutinized as an alternative to petroleum, but production requirements were too great and the yields too small. The value of the plant was not lost on Herb Knudsen, who acquired the research from his employer, Standard Oil of Ohio, and eventually establishing Natural Fibers Corporation in Ogallala, Nebraska. Well, it's a, a bona fide alternative crop from the standpoint that it has uh, raw materials that you can derive from this crop that have a lot of value. Uh, it has uh, three uh, raw materials that we derive from it, the uh, silky white suriaca clusters, uh, the seed and the biomass. And in each of those, we have been able to establish and identify markets that make a lot of sense. One promising high-value, low-volume market was in the use of the floss that carries the seed aloft. It is a fine hollow cellulose fiber enclosed at both ends with a waxy coat that makes it waterproof and an excellent insulator. When mixed with goose down or olefin or even wool, the results are softer, warmer, hypoallergenic products. Removing the floss from the pod and seeds efficiently and cleanly, then blending them with the down was a major hurdle. Mechanical ingenuity and resourcefulness solved the problems, along with a rejuvenated 1940 John Deere combine. 
we uh, came up with this uh, John Deere combine uh, out in an uh, abandoned tree line. The person we had responsible for designing and building our continuous processing unit said, I can make this work. And uh, during a winter, uh, he was out there with a uh, cutting torch and making all sorts of uh, modifications. And he ran it for the first time. Uh, there was floss all over the place, but uh, it worked and it was a, a real eureka in the history of our uh, corporation. High quality cotton shells of pillows and comforters are filled with, with a 70-30 combination of white goose down and Syriaca floss. Then they are sewn, sealed, and shipped to markets at home and abroad. This year they will surpass one million dollars in sales. Until a hybrid seed is developed and cultivation procedures are perfected, the wild collection and drying of the pods is contracted to Marwood and Melvin Lane of Lovell, Wyoming. In 1996, they shipped 60 tons. The 1997 target is 38 tons. The advantage that the wild collections give us is breathing room. Breathing room to work on our production techniques to get them to the point where we can compete very well with other crops. We use a John Deere Maximerge planter, and the only modifications are a slight seed cup modification. Uh, for harvesting, we use an ear corn picker that has been slightly modified to pick the pods off the stems rather than ears. The USDA and universities are actively researching the oil and biomass potential for new products. With a little more research, milkweed can overcome its uh, current stigma. Uh, we'd like to be able to, to use as much of the plant as possible, uh, thereby minimizing the waste streams and optimizing profits. And our goal would be to have uh, a million acres under cultivation by the year 2020, and we think there's a market if we can uh, get the yields and the economics right uh, from the processor and from the farmer's standpoint. To Herb Knudsen, the future outlook is definitely warm and fuzzy. <laughs>
we think if we're out there positioning the product correctly and putting messages behind our milk with our advertising and promotion efforts, the consumers will realize that uh, uh, not only is it a refreshing drink, but it's also uh, uh, good for you and perhaps better for you than some of the other choices out there. To help provide a solid foundation for young people who are serious about agricultural careers, leading companies and individuals in agribusiness have come together to create the Agriculture Future of America. This nonprofit organization is ensuring tomorrow's agricultural leaders are ready to handle the challenges they'll face. The mission of our organization really focuses on providing resources for young people from rural America to be able to continue their education as it focuses on agriculture. The AFA brings together these young leaders each year at its national conference in Kansas City. Here, college students can meet and network with key figures in agribusiness, production, and marketing. The focus of our conference is really on personal and professional skill development. So we're looking at time management, we're looking at ethical decision making, uh, we're looking at group relationships. One of the workshops focuses even on uh, dining etiquette. So our goal there is to send our young people away with personal and professional skills that will make them more, more employable when they finish their academic training. So far it's been great. Uh, we've really learned a lot, had a, some great programs, uh, some great speakers. In addition to the National Conference, one of AFA's most important roles is in providing scholarships and internship opportunities to its members. Through her involvement in the AFA, Angela Watts has acquired an internship at John Deere. It's amazing. There are so many things that go on within the John Deere company and I felt like I got a lot of responsibility this summer as an intern, more so than I ever imagined when I took the job. And I'm very, very, very pleased with all of the things that I got out of it. AFA members aren't the only ones who benefit from these relationships. Ag has a crying demand for talented young people in every industry. The AFA and its activities provide agribusiness with a way to promote all the career opportunities in agriculture. Opportunities that, if unfilled, will leave a void in the industry. If we don't have leaders in agriculture, economic, political leaders capable of moving us into the future, then none of us survive. Today, you look at, uh, at the tables we had assembled this morning and uh, uh, you see the faces of human beings who uh, are willing to see that vision for the future, see that vision of what could be in agriculture, and they're starting to uh, commit their lives and their careers uh, to that ambition. AFA really ties in to the tremendous opportunity that young people have for a career in agriculture and the tremendous growth that's available in agriculture. And the reason we're involved in AFA is we see it as a springboard to uh, developing opportunities for these young people to have a career in agriculture. Yeah.